Hi, good morning, welcome back. Okay, day 30 high booster build, day 30. Effectively a month of working on this old heifer so far, turning it from the old shed that rolled in right at the beginning to the old shed it is now, but with all new nice bushes bearing seals and everything that's consumable and wearable now renewed with shiny stuff. So that's great. Now I'm on the cusp of moving on to the best part of all, the creative stuff. I'm gonna make the bodywork from this and I'm not gonna use fiberglass or filler or pudding or gob or dog bondo, whatever you call it, I'm gonna use steel, aluminium and hopefully brass. I'm thinking steampunk and I'm just rat rod and calf racer and I'm just gonna have so much fun with this. I've invested a big fat wedge of our patrons money. Thank you patron family, you're making this all possible and all of that stuff arrives in the next five days. It's all ordered last night, probably spent way more than I should have done, but I'll reveal it all when it comes. It's stuff that I've always wanted to get my hands on and have a go at, and I'm gonna be able to do that in the next three or four videos after this, but today is a makeup day. It's a kind of a catch up, sign off all the little bits and pieces and get this thing ready so I can finally walk away from all the faffing about I've been doing for the last 30 days. So let's show you quickly today what I've got to do just to catch up and get everything signed off. The first thing is this. Throttle cables to replace. They're in a terrible state, just jamming up, not returning. It's not the spring here on the throttle bodies, it's just cables full of gunge and tube from 20 years, original factory ones, along with the tube here because that's probably all gunged up and worn as well. It's rattling about and some new grips. Next thing. Oil union, that's the straight takeoff that I wanted, not 90 degrees like the last one. So 32 pounds 15 for that one union, but then means I can now put the oil pipe and finish plumbing in the oil cooler. After that job, the next one is this flaming fuel tap. That does indeed just press in. I'm reliably informed from a trusted source that that is nothing more than an interference press fit. The advice given is to warm that up gently with nothing more than a hairdryer. Just get it nice and hot, just warm, hot to the touch, and put it in the vise, a little bit of grease, and just press it in until that line there meets that line there, and that seats out nicely, and that will be fuel tight, so I'm told. So I'm gonna follow that advice. That's the third job. And finally, a big fat tidy up, get everything signed off. And then the next one, I can finally get at it with all my new equipment that should be here in the next three or four days and fantastically, at last, start on the creative stuff by making my tail unit first of all. But today, I've got some finalizing to do, so let's get stuck into it. Welcome back. Right, throttle cables. Now, yes, I know you can oil them, grease them, lubricate them and refurbish them. I've done that myself in the past. There's a video in the playlist. However, on the Hayabusa, the throttle cables pull from the right-hand side of the engine, not in the center, which means that they turn a more acute angle. They come out the throttle, twist grip, they turn a sharp 180 degrees, then back on themselves more, then down this side of the bike. So there's quite a lot of curvature there, which means lots of, nearly all of, the inner wire is rubbing against nearly all of the outer shrouding. So there's a lot of resistance there. And yes, you can oil it, and yes, you can lubricate them, but I've found in the past that six months down the line, they chew up again. Because whatever you put in there, it dries out over time, becomes sticky and slimy, and it's just never right. I've had so many good results with these Slinky Glide cables that to be honest, it's better off for what they cost to just slap a set on there and forget about it. They'll snap back nicely at the end, and if you can, if you can complement that with a new throttle tube, because that gets all slimy and horrible inside, or even at least clean yours, this gets lubricated inside this tube, and obviously that turns into a waxy putty as well and causes more resistance, which means when you get this, look at that, that's, that's stopping at half throttle. So if you went like that on the road, full throttle, let it go, <laughs> it's just staying there. Ain't going anywhere, it's not even going back slowly, that's stuck, unless you physically turn it off. So that's not really safe either, is it? So, cables. First thing is, release the clips that hold all the cabling in place so that you can actually get to them and move them around and then release all the tension off the shrouds so you can actually unhook the ends. That's an easy job. Leave that there. Use the fingers on this. There we are. So I can literally lift that out so it's clear. Do the same with the other one, so I can take it down and out of the way. Once it's off, push the cable forward till the cable itself lines up with the slot 
there. There we are. Same goes to the bottom. Fiddly, there we are. Right, it's both cables released. Now, you can take them out of the bar block. It's raining outside. I'm trying to show you inside the block, see how they're connected. It's very much the same as it is at the other end. Okay, this is the pull cable, and that's the return or push cable, if you like. And the front, the front one, the pull cable, is held in with this little metal plate, little tiny plate there, that's held in with a screw underneath. So just whip the screw out the inside, let it drop away, and the other cable is held in by being screwed into the housing, like that. You just take that out as well, then both cable housings are free to move. And you need them nice and slack like that, so you can get slack on the inside. Right, so with all the slack in place, take the top off with both screws removed and just drop the switch block to one side and you'll see the end of your twist grip there. So where your cables connect into. Let's lift the cable up until it's level with the slot and just jiggle it out with the other one. Lift it up, rotate the whole thing around, lots of slack and just ping it out. There it is. Right, now at this point, um, I've always replaced these tubes if I can. Sometimes you can get aftermarket ones which are perfectly good and perfectly acceptable, but in this instance I've opted to go for a genuine one. So I've got a genuine OEM Suzuki throttle pipe and grip because the amount of times I've replaced them and they are always an improvement. They are never unnoticeable they're always better instantly and if you want that snapback throttle you're investing two cables here these are 20 pounds for these two cables I think it's about nine pounds 95 for the pull cable and it's about 10 pound 50 for the return cable so 20 quid of the cables and then yeah okay you spend a little bit more on the throttle pipe and get that done but for about 50 quid all in you've got your throttle snap back happy and that is so much nicer it's kind of spoiling the ship and all the rest of it the old saying goes put the nice cables on and it's still a little bit chewy because your old grip pipe is just like that one, a bit sticky and a little bit worn and a little bit slack. So I'm just gonna put a new one on at the same time, which involves just dropping off the bar end weight, just for now. I can slip that on and then connect the new cables up. Right, at this point, if your bar has got any nicks or cuts in it, any roughness at all, just get rid of it with some really fine 1200 grit emery. Get it all buffed and smooth and super polished because that will always assist a lovely free spinning throttle. How much better is that? Straight away. Awesome, right. Now I'm just gonna temporarily put this bar weight back on because I'm going to make some brass ones at the end. Um, if I do fit those clip-ons, then they won't be in these bars anyway, so it doesn't matter. But this is purely here, so I know where it is if I need it. first.
Right. Okay, now you've got them hooked up. Just take these two adjusters, these two thumb wheel adjusters, same as when it's a clutch, exactly the same. Give yourself a little bit of movement off the stops. Don't have those adjusters all the way in, bang on the stops, or all the way out right on the last thread. Because if you need to adjust that top end, any way, one way or the other, just for fine tuned adjustment, hot day, cables can stretch, you might need a bit of fine tuning adjustment, end up with far too much throttle play on a hot day. You wanna just take a bit of it out, you need some adjustment up here. So just put it roughly in the middle of its adjustment on both of them, and then leave them alone. They're set for the future if you ever need them. The actual adjustment of the throttle three play, once they're set in the center, is done down here at the throttle body. Right, all rooted correctly. Proper snapback. Look at that. That's absolutely lovely. When you buy an old bike, you find sometimes they always ride like that, a little bit chewy. The levers are a bit chewy and the throttle's always a little bit stiff and that's just the way they are. No, it isn't. It's old cables that get full up with snot and slime and they're just nasty and horrible inside. Stick a set of new slinky glide cables on, a new tube as well, and that's like a brand new bike. Absolutely lovely. That makes riding it just so much nicer. It's more responsive. You're more in tune with it. You feel more in touch with what the motor's doing. I absolutely love that. Practically every bike I buy, I put new throttle cables on it because it always transforms it in an instant. It really does. You can even replace them every 10,000 miles for 20 pounds, cut the cables, jobs are good and it definitely makes a difference. Right, now finally, free play. When you set the free play on your cables, if you've ever been to the dealer, you find you've got your throttle happy exactly where you want it. How many of you, hands up out there, love your throttle to be absolutely there? The minute you touch it, it revs the engine. Well, if you go to a dealer, you have a service, you'll come out and you'll find suddenly there's loads of free play and it feels all weird. There's load, too much take up. That's because there is a, a designated free play setting in your manual and it's normally about an eighth of a turn on the lever or on the grip of free movement before it actuates cables. That's usually what's prescribed. You set what's right for you. It's entirely your choice, but just make sure that if you set it right on the button, like I like mine, I like to touch my throttle and it's right there. But it's very important, as I showed you there, that when you move the throttle, both the cables have got free movement. That at no point are they snagged up or pulling on the throttle and holding it slightly open because you're getting a false tick over as well then. So make sure that you've got free play, but set that free play. So like this here, I've got about two and a half, three mil of free movement in the grip before it actually moves the cables open. That's just your own preference, you set it for yourself. And as I said, just finally make sure these little thumb wheels have got a bit of slack. They've got a little bit of a movement in them so that you can fine tune it on the road if you have to without having to get the tools out. There we are. Right, that's the throttle done. Let's do the oil pipe. Right, as you can see, that goes on there perfectly now. It's just a little bit long, probably by about four or five inches. So I've just got to trim the actual hose down, take this union off the end, trim the hose down, put it back on in the right place. There's just a squeeze fit thingy. And then I can bolt that on. And that's the oil cooler signed off. As in, right, take this end off. Right, okay. Before you flame me, these are not pipe grips, they're smooth jaw, nice and smooth, and they're straight, straight jaw as well, not curved or, they're not pipe wrenches or stilsons or anything, they're for grasping hold of regular ordinary six-sided nuts, fasteners and bolts. I'll stick a link underneath in the description as usual. Okay, that's pushed 
the, the I don't know, the collar bolt back, exposed about four, four and a half inches of extra hose that I don't need. So it's gonna put it up in there, measure to what I think's right, so that when it's installed, there's nothing hanging down below the bottom of the exhaust pipes. Just gonna bring it up to that point. And then when I've done, trim it off, and that just drops back in the hole, just like that. And then that collar comes up, makes together, and causes a nice seal. Brilliant stuff, this. Oil pipe unions gears. This is Goodrich and Earls and Torx. I've used a, a range of products, but it doesn't matter because all this stuff, all this pipe thread stuff is all universal. Whatever brand you make, it all fits together. And these fittings are AN8, Alpha November 8. That's their fitting, that's that size. That's the usual size for all coolers and that sort of thing. Anyway, let's get that exact length. Right, I've got it bared back that's how much i need to cut off and the easiest way to cut this goodridge hosing is with a disc just lop it straight through it cuts it cleanly doesn't fray it everywhere turn it into a bird's nest just the safest way i'm quite sure there are ways that you've got to doing it if you ever cut this sort of thing uh, you see the guys who make brake hoses they just use a guillotine and just chop it it's got a certain rounded jaw in the guillotine that just comes around and just snicks them off but personally i haven't got one of those but i have one of these okay so I'm going to do a test cut halfway up the scrap area. All this is scrap. I'm going to do a test cut up here just to make sure it goes through okay. And then I'll go down to where the union is, which is where that exactly needs to cut, ready for that height. So that will sit neatly in there, unobtrusively out of the way. Right, test cut first. Wish me luck. Right, as you can see, very cleanly goes straight through, makes a lovely job, and even treats you to the smell of burning rubber, which is just wonderful in the morning. Incidentally, something else I just want to pick up on while we're talking about cutting discs. A little while ago, I got a bit of a flame in from some of you saying, why was I grinding? Uh, it was when I was actually cutting out these things, these unions, when I was grinding them, you were saying, why was I grinding on the side of a cutting disc, and don't you know that's dangerous? Well, yes, of course I know it's dangerous. That's a cutting disc or slitting disc. What you saw me grinding on was that, on the side of that. And what that is, has got that back pad. I'm sure you've all seen these. And that's what I was grinding on. It's a sanding disc, a metal sanding disc. This one in particular is uh, 36 grit. I use 36 grit because as you saw in that video way back, it grinds metal like you wouldn't believe. So I use those because I get a box of 110 of them or something just like they give you like a, a mad quantity and you get 110 for about 15 quid. And they last, oh, I forget when I bought the last ones, I think I paid an old money. But there we are, that's what I was grinding on, not on the side of a cutting disc. Like all of you said, never grind on the side of a cutting disc. They are made for only cutting on the end. There you go, but thanks for picking me up. I appreciate your concerns, bears. Right. Thankfully the exhaust is all still adrift because it's all loose, deliberately so. I can just get a spanner on it. Hands up any of you have got spanners in your toolbox that are bent to an angle, heated up, bits sawn out of them or grinded out of them. We've all got one of them just to get in on a certain job. Lovely. Right, they're all nipped up now and I won't know if they're nipped up enough until I get 
uh, the engine running and get oil pressure built back up and watch any of it for weeps. Now that's that done, let's see if I can fix that fuel tap. Right, fuel tap, okay. Now, this little fuel tap, I'm reliably informed that the method of manufacture at the factory is that they are simply pressed in. They're just an interference fit and that seals, that's it. There's no jollop in there of any kind. There's no grease in there, they have to go in dry. Uh, there's no sealant of any kind, it makes no difference because you really aren't gonna find many fully petrol proof sealants. That's why it is just a metal to metal interference fit and it works because that is super soft. That's not even really aluminium. This is just pot metal. You know the score, this stuff's really, really soft and you know you can virtually scratch it with your fingernail. And that needs just to be warmed up with a hot gun. And I'm gonna gently press the two together and make an interference fit and that should seal. So let's see what happens. Slow. Okay, here we are, that's it, done. One fuel tap, restored back to perfect. Awesome, very happy, you can't really see it, but that joint in there is as it's a factory standard, superb. I'm told that that's exactly perfect and that's how they seal. They just press in, bone dry fit, no sealant needed, and that will seal every single time. So with all the rubbers in there new as well, that is one fully refurbished and restored fuel tap for the Hayabusa. Now that's ready to go back into the tank out of harm's way, because that's easy to damage. Once that's ready, I've got a couple more jobs to do under the tank before I can slap it back on. I've got to take uh, one of the air hoses off the air box and blanket off the one that used to feed the air injection, that's redundant now, and a new fuel feed hose for this if you remember because that was nasty and that's it then I put the tank back on and move on Right, fuel hose, uh, that was the piece that was on the bike, it's the original piece, and it's a bit gnarly and horrible, and it's too thick. This is too fat on the outside. Um, this proven by the fact that this anti-kink, anti-crush spring that comes from the factory over the fuel hose, must go over the top of it to protect it. It just didn't want it, it was a nightmare to get it off, and for the life of me now, I can't get it back on. I don't know how they got it on in the first place, loads of WD-40 probably. But that's not going back on there, that's the wrong piece of hose. It's too short anyway, could have done without another three or four inches so that when you lift the tank up, it doesn't stretch it. And that's the right stuff, there it is. I've also got loads of this. This is, I keep sort of five, six foot of this around at any point. That's what I've got left at the moment, that's a good four feet. But this is for the Harley, I bought this and it's great stuff. Uh, it's proper made in the USA, uh, fuel hose line, fuel line hose, fuel line hose. It's good stuff, does the job, and I'm just gonna cut that to length. now. I only put that on the end there because I used it as a header pipe some time ago. So that will fit neatly into there. The spring will go over that nicely. So that's the right size. That proves that that's the right size. And what we'll do is just trim it to length, pop a piece on the pump where it used to be, leave a load of it hanging. And then when it's ready, when I put the tank on, I can cut it exactly where I need it and clip that back onto there. And next time it won't pull the end out because it's the right size. Straight cut. Right, this is the rubber hose that went to the pair system or air injection system, which I've now completely deleted and blanked off. So this is redundant. Let's get it off, take it off the air box where it used to feed from and blank off the hole. Thank you. 
Bang tidy or what? I love that hinge tank, that is so convenient. It means I can get under there whenever I need to without faffing about trying to undo everything. What a lovely simple design. Just pop those in finger loose because I'll be under there again a million times. now right that's it now I always bite off more than I can chew I wanted to put the fairing frame on and the clocks in and tidy all this wiring up that's fiddly and time-consuming and actually really boring so I'm not going to video that I should just do that off camera and get it all sussed and sorted when I've got some spare time in between everything else for now it's half past two and I've just realized I start work at three o'clock so I've got to get showered get changed get wiggle on and get out of here so for now, I've done everything I really wanted to do. I've actually knocked off the last bona fide jobs. There's a load of other little peripheral bits and pieces to do, but now I am ready. That's it. I'm absolutely done with all this faffing around and fiddling about restoring stuff. This is actually now quite a nice condition Hayabusa. If I had a nice set of bodywork to bolt onto this, did a bit of polishing, be a nice bike, but ultimately it's gonna go a completely different way. It's a project and all of the peripheral stuff, every bearing, bush, seal, caliper, master cylinder, slave cylinder, everything is brand new and fully refurbished so I can forget about it and completely focus on the journey ahead, which is now the most exciting part of this build. In the next video, I hope to unveil, I hope to reveal, I have bought for myself an English wheel, a sandbag, some bossing hammers, some sand to put in the sandbag, and some sheet metal to practice on. So the bike's gonna sit there for a minute and wait because the first proper job will be making the tail unit. I wanna make a tail section from aluminium. That will be a, a, a test piece to see if it looks any good. Once I know it looks good, I'm gonna buy some sheet brass and I'm gonna make the tail panel from sheet brass. I'm going steampunk rat rod with this. So that kind of thing is just awesome. Brass is about four times the price of aluminium. So I won't be rolling brass and beating brass until I know I've got the shape right and some skills. Because at the moment, I can actually say, hand up, I have never touched an English wheel. I've never laid hands on an English wheel or ever rolled a piece of metal through one. So I'm so looking forward to that. And thanks to our patrons, for the amazing donations they make, we've been able to put that money aside and save up and I've blown something like 250 pounds on a really nice, well, a bench top. Ordinary, simple, basic English wheel and a really nice sandbag, some bossing hammers and I'm gonna get into some actual metal fabricating. Now, whether I braze those pieces of metal together, I don't know. Whether I solder them together or whether I just weld them, I might use steel, I could use brass, I mean, all sorts of things. But there, look, listen to me being excited like a little child. I'm so looking forward to it. I've ticked off everything within 30 videos. Within one month, this bike is ready for fabrication. So join us in the next video, a big reveal of some fantastic new equipment, which I'm so excited to get my hands on for the very first time. Thank you to our patron team for making that possible. Thank you to all of you for watching. Take it easy, ride safe, and we'll see you in the next one for the exciting stuff.